Oh god. This is Half-Life Alex, a virtual reality video game released on March 23rd, 2020. In the game, it's moments like these that make the player feel immersed, engaged, and, yes, sometimes very scared. And it's moments like these that make Half-Life Alex so rewarding to play, and that have launched it forward as one of the most successful VR titles of all time. But in order for these kinds of moments, and the game at large, to work, we need to design systems that make it easy for any player to translate their intentions into actions and eliminate any barriers that might exist between the story and the person who's experiencing it. In this sense, what's perhaps most interesting about the success of Half-Life Alex is the design of its VR interaction systems. That is, the controls, feedbacks, and other ways in which the player directly interfaces with their virtual environments. So how did Valve, the game development company behind Half-Life Alex, design and implement the game's interaction systems to work well for everyone? And what lessons should VR game designers take from Alex moving forwards? And in a larger sense, how might we apply some of the design strategies used to build this game to the other areas of the rapidly growing field that is immersive technology, even outside of gaming? Let's dive in and take a look. Like any PC gamer, the first thing that I did when starting up Half-Life Alex was opening the settings. I had just wanted to check the graphics and movement options, but instead, I found so much more. In total, there are four different locomotion methods, three different ways of turning, left and right-handed modes, single controller playing, four different height adjust methods to control your crouching or standing, a seated playing mode, three different ways to select your weapons, subtitles and closed captions, a light sensitive mode, and the ability to disable lifting effect because of motion sickness. <sighs> it suffices to say that there are many more accessibility and gameplay options here than are present in most other games, VR or otherwise. This clear pattern in giving so many different ways in which to play Half-Life Alex shows how Valve employed a technique called universal design. What does that mean? The Center for Universal Design at North Carolina State University explains that universal design is the design of products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. When applied to virtual reality, this means making an experience work for people with different levels of ability, body sizes, sensory functions, and more. VR gaming is a much more physical experience than traditional flat screen gaming, so there's a much greater demand for embracing universal design. Furthermore, universally designing for extreme users actually benefits users in the middle too, like how streamers might turn on subtitles to better involve their audience, or how able-bodied players might prefer to play sitting down because that's just more comfortable for them. In VR, designers must create accessibility by default to give as many people as possible the ability to enjoy experiences in whatever way best suits their individual needs. What's Gabe? You may be asking. Once I've figured out the controls of my VR game and put in all the options I can think of, how can I possibly let the player know how to interact with their environment? I'm glad you asked. The idea is simple. Simple is the idea. The game designers at Valve have coined a concept for guiding many of the interactions in Half-Life Alex, and it's called mechanical responsibility. To be mechanically responsible is to make sure that the mechanics in a game physically make sense, that they work how we expect them to. If the player should open a door, they don't press the E key, they reach out and open it. If they need to reload a gun, they don't hold down a button, they figure out how to put in a new magazine. And if they think they can put something on their head, they should be able to put it on their head. Put simply, to be mechanically responsible, make virtual things behave as they work in reality. The effect of this is twofold. On one hand, it improves immersion and lets the player trust the world of the game. And on the other, it makes the game more approachable and ensures the player can use their real life experience to guide their interactions in the future. But that doesn't mean the game itself has to be simple. According to Valve designer Robin Walker, 
Just a single button on two tracked controllers still provides more input data than a keyboard and mouse. And that doesn't mean simplicity is easy to build. Look, here's a talk where Valve's Carrie Davis explains how they designed VR doors. It's 50 minutes long for a door. But that's not the point. Mechanical responsibility is all about providing the most intuitive experience for the user. And by applying this sort of Occam's razor to VR design, we can give the player interactions that, in the words of Todd Howard, just work. Of course you can. Of course you can draw. Wait, can you? Oh my god, you can erase with your finger? That is so cool. Cool. So we'll use universal design to create many different ways to play and mechanical responsibility to make the player's interactions feel more like reality. But we've also implicitly created several new questions, like how do you decide which accessibility features to implement, and how far should we go when trying to simulate reality? The answers to these questions are different for each VR experience, but in each case the answers can be found through the process of user testing. Throughout several interviews, Valve designers reiterated the importance of observing playtests at all stages of Alex's development. For example, studying users from the beginning led to simplifying the button inputs of the gravity gloves, improving the audiovisual feedback of the teleportation system, and even adding contextual voice lines based on what playtesters organically said. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah, that's what I said. Although every game is different, there are some key takeaways from Valve's user testing that could be useful to VR developers in general. For one, players are much slower in VR. That is, not only do they take more time to pass through an area, but they also pay more attention to what's around them. This means developers can spend more effort focused on denser, highly detailed, and more personal environments and interactions as opposed to the sprawling and largely empty open worlds of games today. Also. Because players pay much more attention, and because virtual reality introduces so many new interactions, it can be a lot easier for things to break in VR. One simple limit to mechanical responsibility that Valve embraced was to make sure that the experience won't break for a player who isn't trying to break it, but that it's okay if some things go wrong when someone's purposefully disregarding the virtual fantasy. Game design is very much under the umbrella of design thinking, so game designers should learn to work like design thinkers. According to the global design firm IDEO, as long as you stay focused on the people you're designing for and listen to them directly, you can arrive at optimal solutions that meet their needs. Especially for VR. Get your experience out early, into the hands of other people, before you release it to the world. Even if you don't have the immeasurable budget of Valve, at a minimum you can still find a few friends, roommates, or family members to playtest. The best way to make a VR game that will be enjoyable by players is by designing it around what your players enjoy. This philosophy of universal design, mechanical responsibility, and user testing worked for Half-Life Alex, and perhaps it'll work for other VR games too. At the very least, these concepts seem to form a very solid starting ground upon which to guide VR development in the future. But what if you aren't a game developer? Why does any of this matter? You see, VR today is much larger than just gaming. Already it's widely used in medicine for virtual training and even conducting surgeries, in engineering for architectural visualization and automotive design, and in entertainment to make film productions like The Lion King and The Mandalorian, and to power new digital experiences like VR concerts or parties. And that's just today. With the realities of a socially distanced 2020, more people than ever are seeking to find safe ways in which to virtualize life, so the already rapidly growing field of VR is only going to get bigger, faster. Think of all the future VR jobs that you or people you know might later have that don't even exist yet. While we're still a far away from our virtual dreams of Ready Player One, we get a little bit closer every day through innovation largely driven by VR gaming. As virtual reality becomes more of a real reality, Perhaps we can learn a little bit from games like Half-Life Alex today in order to build a more accessible, intuitive, and fun tomorrow.